cook and a conversation featuring Chef Matthew Statham. So we're here today with Matthew Statham. How you doing, bud? I'm doing well. How about yourself? Doing real well. Good to see you. Always a pleasure. Uh, what is this beautiful slab of goodness in front of us today? Uh, these are basically beef ribs. Uh, it's a, a short plate rib. So if you ever had short ribs, braised short ribs, flank short ribs, it's this cut of meat after they slice it. Um, basically, this is three beef ribs. Okay. Um, comes from purveyor like this. Most of the time, it's going to be trim. There's a little fat cap on it. If there's ever any really hard fat cap or any exposed silver skin, I'm going to try to take some of that off. But you want to leave the fat on as much as possible. Just it helps base the meat. Uh, it'll keep the actual meat from absorbing too much smoke, keep it from drying out, which is not really a problem if you can look and see how much intermuscular fat's in there. Yeah. It's it's gonna cook up really moist, juicy, and delicious. Man. And you haven't done too much trimming as we can kind of see here on the top. Huh? Not a whole lot. We have a little extra silver skin in a couple of these spots, but this is basically out of the pack. Um, we get them, we have a local meat purveyor. Um, you can check with your local butcher if they sell short ribs. Most of the time they will cut them in house. You can just ask for the whole thing and they'll give you, basically it'll be two slabs is normally in a pack. Um, and that's usually the easiest way to get it since they're not really prevalent yeah. in our part of the world. Right. Well, that's great, man. So how do you want to go about uh, seasoning them up? These, them we, we go real simple. In your, in your mind, if you think about it, it's really similar to a brisket. Okay. Um, so in my head, I always equate that to a steak. And I don't ever want to put, like pork will put a little more seasoning, a little more flavor to it. The beef fat is such a pronounced flavor, I like it. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go a little bit of hot sauce, a little bit of salt and pepper. Nice. Um, biggest thing on your pepper, grind it. Okay. Like I just have a coffee grinder that's in the, in the closet. It's just for pepper. Um, you can keep it a little bit chunkier. You don't lose that oil, so you get a lot better flavor out of it. You can right. smell like it's a lot more pungent. Now, you recommend it, like if I at home, I've got this, you know, pepper grinder, right? You can. Um, it, it's going to be a little bit of work, but it'll be worth it. Yeah. Uh, we want to do about three to one salt to pepper. Okay. Um, I like to use a kosher salt just because I can see it. Right. It doesn't absorb into the meat as fast, so you don't over salt it. Nice. Switch with a piece of meat this big. It's hard to over salt it, but it's possible. Um, so what I really like to do is just start your favorite hot sauce. I'm a big fan of crystals. Oh yeah? Yeah. So How really about Tabasco. Tabasco will work in a pinch. <laughs> um, we really don't want to do a lot. This is basically not so much for flavor as much as it is a binder. Gotcha. Um, so think like if you ever put mustard on a pork butt, you yeah. just want to go really thin with it. It will bring a little bit of flavor but like I said, for the most part, it's just to make sure that that rub sticks to it. I love crystals, man. Any like Louisiana hot sauce, it, it, you know, give me some fried chicken and, and some, some hot what, sauce. That's exactly and right. I'm in heaven. And then the biggest thing with this is that it tends to settle. So as you're, as you're doing it, which I normally just do it out of the shaker, yeah. um, just keep it moving. And that way you tend to get, you don't want to get a lot of hot spots. So you don't want too much salt okay. in one spot. And then just make sure you hit everything. So we do we do sides, just get a good coat. Mm -hmm. Now beef ribs are, are, are fairly inexpensive to go from the grocery store to get. I know that if you're trying to go out in the public, somebody's gonna charge an arm and a leg for one rib, I would assume. Yeah, they're they're it is a it's it's a good bit more expensive honestly than pork. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of that has to do with why it's not so prevalent here. Um, you know, you see braised short ribs on the menu. You'll see like this flank and cut maybe at an Asian restaurant. You don't really see a lot of, at least in my part of the world, you don't see beef ribs on menus at barbecue places. Right. Yeah. Um, it's actually relatively new to barbecue in the mm -hmm. grand scheme of things. So like. You, know, you got brisket, sausage, or originals. Um, so it's, I say, new in the last you know 60, 70 years. Yeah. It's been a, I guess, a new fad. If, if you consider the, the I love a that barbecue's fad. been around. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so that's really, and and that's it. Like we don't want to do, you don't want to kill it. You don't want to overpower it. You don't want to do anything to take away from the beef flavor. You want it to taste like beef. Yeah. Yeah. Just like a steak. I love yeah. the salt and pepper on Same. the steak. Same same thing we want to do here. Just don't want to overpower. We start with really good quality meat. Don't mess it up. Perfect. I love it. 
Well, let's get this uh, thing on the grill, see where it goes from there. Sounds good. All right, so we've, we've made our way out, got the cooker uh, ready to go. Um, are you using any specific type of charcoal, any type of adding any more wood to it? What What we're using is some golden slump charcoal. Uh, I so heard that's good. Yeah, it's good stuff, you know. <laughs> uh, so the bigger pieces of, of charcoal really do better on these, especially these slow cooks. Yeah. Um, for the beef, I do like to throw just a good solid hunk of hickory, or if you can't do, sometimes you can purchase, you know, bigger. We just, we obviously get logs at the store we can just cut down. Yeah. Um, in a pinch, you can do a handful of chips on there just to give it a little bit more flavor. Nice. So we're just gonna throw these on. Bad boys on. Just obviously wanna go bone side down. Mm -hmm. Kind of situate them. Two slabs on here is just, is just because it's so much, you know, they're so big as many as I can get. Okay. Perfect. Um, with the beef ribs, they can hold a little bit more temperature. So I know most of the time we're going to cook, say, pork butts, ribs, we cook around 225. Yeah. Um, beef ribs, you can get into like the 285, 300 range. Gotcha. Um, it's still gonna be a longer cook, so I tend to go a little on that short side to around 285. Right. The beauty of this is I can get it to 285, drop them on there, and it's perfect. That's right, right where set that. it. You know, you just get your air dialed in, which I've cooked enough of these, and it's like, hey, that big, that big. Or figure that out. Um, so these are gonna go generally around five to six hours. Okay. Um, if you're looking, if you're a temperature person, which we can't always do in barbecue, you want to get them to about 205-ish, two, okay. uh, 200 to 205. But really with the beef ribs, you just, you want to take a butter knife, a probe thermometer, um, and it'll go through them like butter. Just make sure and tip it in different spots, because sometimes you know, the bigger spots obviously will cook as fast. Right. Um, so you really want to make sure all of it is... Just, I mean, literally, it'll just, you'll feel like you're probably I mean, no resistance, you'll go all the way through. So we've got our beef ribs pulled off, and we've uh, put them in the cool, you wrapped them up. We do, we, we wrap them in an unwaxed butcher paper. Okay. Um, you can use aluminum foil. The problem with aluminum foil is it doesn't let the air, it doesn't let the meat breathe, it doesn't let air circulate. So yeah. that bark that we worked really hard to, to, to build on that beef, you're gonna lose it. You're gonna pick up like a, uh, it's gonna be more of a pot roast type texture, which is still delicious. Right. But you've worked hard to get that, the bark on there and you wanna keep it. So we wrap it uh, and I just drop it in the cooler. Yeah. It needs to sit for about an hour and that's just the, the last part of that cooking process. It just kinda helps all that heat, all the juices redistribute. Sort of like when you let any piece, any piece of meat you let rest. So like after you cook a steak, you, know, you let it rest before you cook into it. Um, and that will really be, like I said, that's the last of it. We give it about an hour in there. While it's waiting, it gives us, we've still got this hot grill. Uh, might as well use it. Yeah, for sure. I love uh, that. So we need to open it up since we've had it at 275, cooking the ribs all day. We need to open up the air vents, give it a little more heat so we can cook this corn. So once we've got it up to temp, uh, we just want to open it. Always kind of want to burp it, let that air get in there a little more gradually so it doesn't flame up. So you keep the hair on your hands. And now we've got a good hot fire. It's running probably 375, 400. We just want to put the corn, the, the vegetables on here. We just want to get a char on this. This is fresh corn, so it does not need to cook for a really long time. We're really doing this mostly for flavor as opposed to cook. And the same thing with the squash. Um, these are all baby young, young vegetables, so they're not going to take a whole lot of time to cook. All right, so we've got our corn off the grill. We've got our little snacks. We've got our squash. So uh, we're gonna make ourselves a succotash, right? That's the plan. We're just gonna make a little simple summer succotash. Um, we just need to take the corn, we're gonna cut it off the cob, uh, basically take it and warm up everything. Uh, doesn't really have to be hot, everything's cooked, so this is just gonna kind of be, put everything together, let everybody get happy together. I love that, getting happy together. We're gonna put it in a cast iron skillet. We're gonna skillet. put it in a cast iron skillet, we're gonna throw it back on the grill for just a few minutes. Like I said, just warm everything through, get a little, a little crispy edges on some of the beans. Um, get you a little bit of extra flavor. Perfect, looks great.
right, so we're ready to dive in to these beautiful beef ribs. Pull them off, we let them rest, we've got our succotash ready. Matthew and I are going to sit down and have a great conversation, but first, the piece de resistance is right. to say, huh? That's Let's it. See it. Let's see it. Right. We're going to unwrap it. Whoa. Got some good glistening fat on there. Okay. See that bark that we've built? People will be like, oh, that's, that's burnt. That's perfect. That's exactly what you want. Now, what, what, talk to me about what makes the bark and, and, and all about that for the folks that may not know. The biggest deal with this is it's just the, the juices from the, the, the fat and the juice from the, the beef mixed with the smoke, mixed with the salt, make like a crust. If you, I mean, you can feel it, there's a little bit of crunch to it, but it's by no means like a heavy char burnt crust. Yeah. Um, so this is exactly what you're looking for. Like I said, it turns a lot of people off to look at it and be like, oh, that's burnt. It's like, it took six hours to make it look like that. Just try it. <laughs> so that's the biggest thing is just look at it. And we'll just, we'll take it off. You can see where a little bit of this fat's kind of absorbed off right. of it. We still got plenty of that, so don't worry. And then we'll just take, and it's pretty obvious, we'll just cut, cut between the three bones. Yeah. What we're looking for you see there's plenty of fat still in there plenty of moisture it's Beautiful. gonna be delicious absolutely it smells pretty fantastic i don't, I don't know about that i don't know <laughs> well so this looks awesome man and uh i am ready to dive in how about you that sounds like a good plan good deal. i'm hungry so we'll be right back all right so we're finally here and, and about to dig into this food and, and enjoy some conversation because that's really what it's all about right we, we, yeah. we're cooking all this and it's about the fellowship that's around it. the table and the food and um so yeah this is great so tell me a little bit about what got you passionate about food i grew up in the kitchen i mean it just I'm from the south and just basically every event you know just kind of centers around food it's mm -hmm. like you guys you get together you meet you eat uh, my grandmother's, both my grandmothers, particularly my dad's mom, was every time I saw her, it was like, hey, are you hungry? You want to eat something? And it was never like, you know, a peanut butter jelly sandwich. It was like, hey, let me fix you like a four course meal. Right. Um, and then my mom has always, my whole life, I've helped her cook. And then dad, too, you know, we always barbecued, you know, the Memorial Day, Labor Day, Fourth of July. We have right. a big family. So everybody got together and it was, I mean, it's an undertaking. You know, we weren't cooking like two slabs of ribs. You're cooking for, 25, 30 people every time. Right. So that just kind of seemed like a natural fit. You know, when, you, when I sat down, and I was like, hey, I was working a job I didn't love. And I was like, what can I do that I enjoy? And that was, hey, you know, I've always enjoyed going to the kitchen. I've always enjoyed doing this. You know, we've cooked outside, we've, you know, baked, done whatever. So it was just a natural fit. We just fell into it. Nice. So did, did you kind of transition into that by going to culinary school or did you just like, I worked for years in, in the restaurant business so I, I knew that, that some folks kind of just started at the bottom and went up. I actually did a, a little bit of both. So I, I actually worked right out of high school, uh, restaurant job, just, you know, kind of a, you know, always hiring. Right. Exactly. So I basically t took a, a restaurant job, worked in there for a year, a little bit over, went and did retail. And when I decided I wanted to go back, I figured I'd get serious about it. And so I actually went to culinary school and then kind of did the same thing. Just started with a little bit better base, um, started at the bottom of the kitchen, worked my way up. Nice. Absolutely. So what do you enjoy cooking? Uh, your favorite thing? I know we did beef ribs today, which by the way, let's take a bite of these real quick. Hold on. Can we do that? Can we just shut up and eat for a I second? Think, I think we can. <laughs> Man, I mean, just a fat, just a beautiful beef. I mean, it just, it, it melts in my mouth, man. Good to hear. Mm. What are you doing? I think they're pretty fantastic. We do like to put just a little bit of finishing salt on there, just because we've got to chef it up a little. We do a little fancy. Right. You can season the outside as much as you want when it's three inches thick. The inside needs a little bit of salt. For so sure. You'll probably argue that, but I like salt. Yeah, it's argument, right? That's what it's about. Uh, I really have always 
enjoyed going back to what I remember when I was young. Like I remember eating, you know, we ate, you know, we had gardens, so we ate okra, we ate fried green tomatoes, we ate, you know, vegetables and green peas and squash. And so you grew up on this stuff. And then it's like, if I can take what we did growing up and not even, I think refine is probably a bad word, mm -hmm. but just maybe just upscale just a little bit, you know, get back to how I think it was done originally. Right. Because you, you run into a lot of this, like you get this quote unquote Southern food where there's a lot of like opening cans. You know, opening cans, warming it up, everything's fried. I mean, it's not, how, so they, it's that's just, not how they always do it. And so that's, I think there's, there's definitely a history there that we lost touch with over, uh, um, you know, over the years. And I, I kind of like trying to get back to what I think it was more like. Because I remember, you know, being in my grandmother's kitchen and she never had, she didn't have stuff in the freezer. It wasn't, hey, you're hungry, let's put a frozen pizza. You know, I, I never, like, that never happened in my house. So, I mean, I, later in the years, obviously, of course. Know, mom and dad work, and we're in school, and there's two of us, and, you know, mom's not going to cook dinner every night. But, right. You know, that, and I understand, like, the world has, the world's gotten faster. Sure. It's moved on. So I think it's time to maybe take a step back, especially with food, and just kind of go back to what it used to be. And I think people recognize that, and they're like, oh, this is so good. And it's like, it's just simple. Right. Like, don't overcomplicate it. Like, go get the best thing you can find. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be mass-produced. You know, if, if it's out of season and you, oh, I didn't realize I could get that. Probably don't need to buy it. Yeah. Because some of that stuff's not delicious. So that's really the my biggest thing is, like, if I can get it local, I'd love to get it local. That's really great during the summer. Mm -hmm. During the winter, maybe not so much. So we just kind of have to find workarounds, you know, with like, we try to put stuff up so we're canning peas, you know, doing stuff like that, just to get back to how, you know, if you didn't grow it, you didn't eat it. Right. And so and we still have the modern convenience of this, so we're not, we don't do it because we have to, we yeah. do it because we want to. So that's a different spin on it, I think. I love that. I love that. So you're talking about your grandmother, and uh, what was your favorite thing that your grandmother would make you? Man, everything that... If I ever stop and think I need this, I think how did she make it? Right. And honestly, my mom did the same, and so mom can make all of it, and That's so, so great. we didn't lose a whole lot of that. And then um, I guess with her, I, I remember I remember her making fried okra and fried green tomatoes. I know nice. the cliche; it's fried, but I can remember her pot roast and her mashed potatoes. Like you can still. You have that memory. It's yeah. Like you, you taste something now, and it's like it's always going to be your gold standard. It's like my eh, grandmothers are better. Right. <laughs> and so, like, there's a lot of a lot of stuff like that, and and so that was. I mean, it really. And and when it comes down to it, it was never so much when I remember it. I don't remember single food items, but I remember her always like taking the time to do it and prepare it. And so it was more how she made us feel through food than what she actually put on the plate. Which what you put on a plate was delicious, right. but like the memory is not, of, oh my God, that was the best fried chicken I ever had. It was like, hey, do you remember when you see our grandmother, she used to do this. So nice. that's more of my memory on it. I love that. I love that. So I was going to put a bunch of food in my mouth, but <laughs> it doesn't matter what she does. So you've been a big supporter of Goldens, and, and um, you know, we met last year right. at the uh, slider showdown that's right and which you were a champion co-champion i should say <laughs> so yeah, to be correct you've got the check in the back I, I, I still have that big check right here. <laughs> you got to keep the big i couldn't check. part myself i've never gotten a big check before so i had to hang on to it i've never gotten a big check out, so <laughs> i would keep it too but so and you, you're cooking all the time on it and look Tell me a little bit about what you love about it and why it's just become a part of your home. I, I love it, especially, I mean, we're in Alabama. It's, it's, it gets hot, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, I know it's outside, but it, it keeps the house cooler. So like, I can go outside and it's so versatile that I can bake on it, I can throw a skillet on it, I can cook steaks on it, I can cook whatever. So it's not just, hey, I need to grill on this. Yeah. And, but I can do more stuff, especially since the temperature is so consistent. So like we set it, once you get that fire right, you get it at 300 degrees or whatever. I mean, you do whatever you want to. I mean, it's just like your oven. Yeah. Um, so I really appreciate that part of it. And then if you want to grill, like if you want to get it ripping hot and cook a steak or cook burgers or whatever, it's 
not so complicated or fussy that it takes you know hours to get it going. You can just crank it up and go. Yeah. So it, it's really it's kind of the best of both worlds for me, where you can cook low and slow on it, or you can cook hamburger on it, and you know it's not it's not this big complicated ordeal to light it up and you know get a fire going. So right. I appreciate that, and I appreciate you know the chance to get out there and not be. I'm in a kitchen. You know, I do it for a living, so I look at floor walls all day. I mean, a barbecue place, but nonetheless, still, I'm inside a lot. So it's nice to just be like, hey, go outside. Yeah, so absolutely. You, you lose sight of that sometimes, but there's times when you really appreciate, hey, I get to go outside. And so that's another advantage of it. And I think it speaks highly of just your, your love of cooking, because you're, you're, like you said, you're in, in that, you're cooking all day long, and then you come home, and then you're like, oh, I'm going to go cook some more. Hey, I, I got to play around with it. Like we're, you know, I love barbecue, obviously. Right. We love to smoke stuff. I get to do that, you know, every day. That's, that's work. Yeah. But it's fun to come home and be like, hey, I, you know, I just want something else. Well, what would you like? Well, I saw this at the grocery store. Let's go cook it. I can figure out a way to cook it on the go. So I appreciate that. You know, the versatility with the, with the sear plate and like I said, with the, the temperature being so consistent, if I want to cook a pizza or you want to cook pancakes or you want to get, you know, whatever, you can yeah. cook it and it gives it, you know, a little bit, like we talked about, you can, you can cook greens, you can cook sides, mm -hmm. you don't just have to use it for protein. It's, you know, we grilled the squash, we grilled the corn, like you add an extra layer of flavor on stuff that you can't, you can't really replicate in the kitchen, like right. in the kitchen your house, I mm -hmm. should say. I mean, I could do it at work, but I did it here at the Protocol Fire Department, so. <laughs> it's nice to have that just, hey, if I want this to be 700 degrees, I can get it to 700 degrees. If I want it to hold at 225 and cook pork butts, I can do that too. So, that's really nice. And what advice would you have for an aspiring new kind of backyard chef in general and with the Goldens? Don't be scared to experiment. It's okay to mess up. It happens. Like, you burn stuff. Stuff happens. The best advice I could give you was don't go out and buy filet you know, like mignon first time you cook it. Right. Like, you want to learn how to do it, go get some pork chops. Like, get an idea of how it operates, how it works before you, so walk before you run, I guess. Yeah. So if you need to cook burgers a couple of times to figure out how hot this is, how it's going to do, I mean, you don't want to go drop $100 on you know, a piece of meat and just destroy it. Right. So, I mean, pork butts are always a good place to start. You get a lot of meat for, you know, under 20 bucks. Right. And it's a good way to start, you know, with smoking um, turkey breast, chicken. Yeah. Chicken's, you know, it's, it's inexpensive. So you can take those things and, and learn without breaking the bank. I mean, that's my, that was, you know, kind of my perspective on it was, hey, I'd like to be able to do this, but I don't really want to go try to cook a rack of lamb on it if uh, I'm going to burn it. You know, I'm just going to burn it up. Right. That's the biggest thing. It's just play around. It's like if you see something like you're on TV, you see it on the internet, you see, hey, that looks like a cool idea. I think I can do that. Try it. I mean, that's the word. You mean you can always, right. you can always eat a peanut butter and jelly if you screw it up like that. It's it's amazing to me how <laughs> how readily accessible information is. You know, because and it's, exactly. it's uh, it's something that I. It's true. It's just it, it's it's always readily there. And if I need if I have a question on answer, there's someone on <laughs> exactly. YouTube. That Somebody on YouTube has a video of it. Has a video that'll walk you right through it, and uh, it it just uh, it's there. So but. the information's there. I mean the especially there's been a, you know a big movement towards food, so it's easier now than it ever has been to get ingredients that you know even five years ago were like I can't get that. Anymore. I mean, besides the internet, I mean, just like local grocery stores are starting to carry so much more stuff that you can play around with, like different flavors, different proteins, different vegetables, you know, when stuff's in season, like, and then go to the grocery store, you know, big chain grocery store over here, and they have stuff that you would have had to track down at the farmer's market, you know, five, six years ago. Yeah. So that's really a cool thing, is that the world gets smaller every day, so it gives you a chance to explore without having to you know, break the bank or you don't have to go to the other side of the world to eat like that. So that's something I appreciate. Okay. So, I mean, this succotash is outstanding. Glad you enjoyed it. I do. And, uh, but, well, no buts. I mean, it just, it's such a nice kind of just summer yeah. dish. 
We're just trying to think of something that would be a lighter, a little more kind of acidic to cut through because this the beef is fantastic, but it's heavy, mm -hmm. especially when the weather's warm. It's heavy, so we really just the base of it all is pork because I am a pork guy at heart. Right, bacon makes it, everything better. It's what better. I do. So we did that bacon. We saved the bacon fat, and so we sauteed the. Uh, we got some fresh uh, baby butter beans here. Saute that in the bacon fat and just get a little crisp on them. Um, then we have that squash and the corn that we cooked on the Goldens earlier. Had a little char, a um, little red pepper just to give it some texture. A um, couple of heirloom tomatoes we throw in there at the end. We don't really want to cook them. We just kind of want to warm them through and get to know each other. Mm -hmm. um, hit a little bit of smoked salt, a little bit of uh, red wine vinegar, a little bit of olive oil, and then just taste it. Mm -hmm. I like salt, a little more salt, and then some just chives in there just to give it a little bite of fresh. Yeah. Well, I mean, it turns out wonderfully. That that vinegar just cuts it beautifully, you know, in my opinion. I, I think it uh, just gives it that pop that... There's also, uh, I didn't think about this, there's also a little lime zest in there, mm -hmm. lime juice, just to give it a little more of that vinegar pop, a little more freshness, just to keep that, because there's a little bit of fat in there from the bacon, obviously, and the bacon fat. So just kind of cut through that to help cut through the beef also. Right. It's like summertime popping in my mouth. There you go. <laughs> That's what we were shooting for. What was that? Good. And so, and again, back to the ribs, you know, it's just, it was so simple. Yeah. You know, if you're really thinking about it. I don't know why I kind of, in my head, overcomplicated it. That's it. People have a stigma with it where they think like, oh, I need to do this or I need to do that. And it's... I mean, you can add, you know, you play with it. You like garlic, put some garlic on there. You like hot, put some cayenne on there. I'm simple. I like salt, I like pepper. We put that little bit of hot sauce on there, but, you know, you look, it doesn't really bring right. heat to it. Like I said, it's more of a binder. But really, this stuff is just, it's the same way with barbecue. You ask 10 different people, you get 10 different answers. I just think it's, keep it simple, and it's fine. If you want to play with it, play with it. It's yours. And so just own it and do what you do. And we, this, the same thing with the wood. We do hickory because we're in Alabama, it's prevalent. Right. Once you get out towards Texas, you may run into post oak or mesquite or fruit woods up through the Carolinas and Georgia. And it's just, that's what's there. Yeah. And so it's not like, oh, I don't have hickory, so I can't make this. Well, use what you got. And it'll, it'll give it a little bit different flavor. It'll make it taste a little different. And it'll make it yours. Right. So that's the biggest thing of barbecue. Just own it. Like, just make it how you want to make it. Like there's not a right or wrong, just if you like it, it's right. And it doesn't matter if someone's, oh, well, that's not how you cook barbecue. So be it. <laughs> that's your opinion. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm going to eat it. You don't have to. So that's really the biggest, I think the biggest thing with it. I'm getting meat sweats. That's what's, it's hot there. That's, <laughs> man, Brantley got the meat sweats. Meat it's sweats. Time. Todd's over there just like, oh, I'm cool. I'm cool. I, I'm with, see, the trick is with Todd. And you just don't feed them, that keeps them, keeps them <laughs> and going for it. Keeps them vigilant. Huh? Going for it. Man, well, I'll tell you, we've got, I mean, this is great. And, you know, I, I think I've reached my point, and, and these peaches keep on. They keep looking keep, at you. Keep, well, it's, we're looking at each other, is what's <laughs> happening. We're looking at each other, and uh, I don't know, can you hear the peach talking? Maybe a little. It's kind of a whisper. Yeah. Anyways, but how about we dive into that and, and talk to you? So you said that um, this was just a simple. This was kind of a hey, what do we have in the pantry? Mm -hmm. And just to be perfectly honest. We did uh, just so we got some fresh peaches. Pick them up from. We got a produce guy. You can get a produce guy. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds like all fancy but you know, the produce stand there's a farmer's market there's a something Everywhere. close to your house yeah go talk to them meet the guy ask him what's good and they will never lead you wrong right so i have uh, guys there's j and s produce and okay. they come to there and home with and he'll be like hey hey matt uh, uh, i got freestone peaches in this week and i was like yes bring me some of those and right. it's just make relationships with these people like you don't like you don't have access obviously to go to the farmers a lot of the times but there's always a person behind this so like you go find your produce and go find the farmers market make friends with them and they will never lead you wrong same way with your butcher we talked about with the meat right. go talk to them 
hey, what do you have? You got anything back there? You got anything, you know, you don't maybe maybe don't have out here? And I mean, he can tell you no, or he can tell you, hey, we just got this in. It's great. And so it was the same way with this dessert, is that we just took basically that he brought in, and I was like, man, I really want to make something with these peaches just to highlight them. Had a little heavy cream, had a little nip of bourbon left in there, some brown sugar. Um, so we just whipped up just a quick basic whipped cream, made that streusel topping, it, and that sounds fancy, but it's just basically, it's flour, butter, brown sugar, oatmeal. I put just a little bit of cinnamon in it. You don't want to overpower it. Yeah. And just a pinch of salt. Um, just bake it off. It really is just texture, so it's crunchy. It's not even, you don't have to have it. If you've got peaches, cream, it's perfect. Yeah. Um, here again, you just want to highlight that peach, and we, we put it on the gold ones to get that little char, bring some of that sugar to the, to the front, it concentrates a little bit, and that's really it. So just nothing complicated, just simple, fresh, light, and delicious. Nice. Now, you, you said these these peaches are Chilton peaches, right? They're from Chilton County. And, you know, I, I'm from Georgia, I right? I know you guys are from Georgia. Right, so, so it, it, it's a, and I'm not, I'm not discounting Chilton peaches at all. <laughs> uh, it's not my thing, and, but, you know, I, I travel around a whole bunch and I've just driven through Chilton County and I see all these peaches out yeah. there. Uh, so this is kind of, uh, I'm excited. This to, is like their thing. So this is what, if you, Chilton County, it, it was like a rite of passage when you're going, when, most of the time it was coming home, but right. going to the beach, you pass a giant peach, their water tower, you yep. a giant peach, and go to the peach park and yeah. get peach ice cream, peach cobbler, peach whatever you want. Right. Their barbecue's cooked on peach wood. Yeah. I mean, it's all peaches. <laughs> And so that was the thing we kind of grew up with. And so, again, this is reminiscent of stuff like that. So, dig in, let me know what you think. Mm -hmm. Ooh, mm. that is perfect. <laughs> wow. Does that, that. The streusel comes in with that crunch. Like, I'm a cobbler guy. Like, if yeah. I'm going to have a dessert, exactly, it's going to be peach, apple, crisp, cobbler, something with ice cream Amen. and crunch and fruit. So this just kills there all and just brings it all together for me. And, uh, man, I'm, I'm, I, I love chilled beaches. Hey, there you this go. is great. Here's a brown one. Another bite. You going to have some? Uh, yeah. Come on. Twist my arm. I am twisting your arm into getting it into that. Mm. And this is also a good way, like if you if you get to the farmer's market and your eyes are bigger than your stomach and you buy some fresh fruit that's maybe not got a whole lot of time left, mm -hmm. make something like this with it and I guarantee you, if you have trouble getting people to eat fruit, they'll eat this. Yeah. <laughs> I'd definitely be in on that for sure. Well, Matt, man, this has been an absolute pleasure and I, I, I really appreciate your time and inviting us into your home. Hey, it's for, glad to have you for a cook and a conversation. And uh, thanks for being part of the wow. Gomes Cast Iron family. Brian. Thank you guys. We Keep up the good work. Thank you very much. <laughs> we will, with your help. There you go. All right. Well, thank you very much for tuning in, and uh, we'll be back with more cookers and conversations. But here's the thing I'd like to do. So for you people that are out there, that well, not you people, for all of us people <laughs> out there. Uh, I'm going to pose a question to you, and in, in the bottom of there in the comments, beef ribs, best barbecue ever, pork butts, best barbecue ever. Let the arguing commence. Thanks again. Have fun. We'll see you next time here on Cook and Conversation. Cook and a Conversation, featuring Chef Matthew Statham, hosted by Brentley Hudson.